So my name is Scott Layback and I am the Permaculture Manager here at Kalani. And um, I'd like to say that we are uh, definitely trying to do our part for food sovereignty and security in Lower Puna. And um, part of that is hosting these events in conjunction with the County of Hawaii and uh, the Hawaiian Sanctuary. One of the things that we're going to be doing here um, that's in our intention that we move forward on making this happen is to bring a natural food store to Lower Puna. Um, and we want it to be locally based and based on as much local produce as possible. There will be some things in there that we can't necessarily source locally, but the main intention is to be a hub for producers in Lower Puna to distribute so they don't have to go into Hilo. Um, and so that brings me to this thought. If you know people that are producing things that would like to have a place to sell things, um, Kalani currently is buying for the kitchen. You can come up here and make arrangements with the kitchen, contact kitchen at Kalani, uh, and they will make arrangements to buy on site. Once the store is in place, we will be buying without invoice, meaning we won't pay you later, we will pay you then. Um, and we will do that here for both the market and for the kitchen. So get the word out that Kalani is going to be looking to be buying from local farmers and local producers. And that's definitely a focus. Um, so part of this event is the networking that goes along with it. And this networking is very important if we're going to be able to buy from the producers down here in Lower Puna, because we don't necessarily know everyone down in Lower Puna and what they're producing. Um, and along those lines, one of the things that we are trying to develop as well is a website called uh, punapermaculture.org. Uh, I don't believe it's off the ground yet. Jeremiah, the developer, is not here right now. Um, but it has all of Puna divided into Ahu Pua'as, and it has, uh, it's kind of like a farmer's Facebook, essentially. Um, and it's a way for us all to say what we're producing and to share our information. And there'll be a wiki on there as well, so we can put any of this information about seed saving and about fertilizing and creating uh, IMOs or EMs or whatever it is onto that one website. And it can be a one-point access for people in Lower Puna to connect with each other. So keep looking out for that. And the video content. Video content. Oh, the video content will be on there as well. And we're going to have all of our um, modern Ahupua presentations videotaped um, and or transcribed and then put up on that website. As well, uh, Kalani has a very aggressive goal of producing two years of sustainability for 200 people by the year 2020. Um, and that is our, our conversation that we're having here. How do we get ourselves moving in that direction? Um, and I can realistically tell you from my perspective that it's going to be a very difficult thing, if not impossible by 2020. But it definitely puts us out there with an aggressive goal. And the aggressive goal is the thing, I think, that drives us further than we might go if we hadn't given ourselves as aggressive of a goal. So um, along those lines, I need the community support as the permaculture manager. Um, to grow food, and that means I need sources of seed and I need cuttings and things like that. So um, if you do have things that you're willing to trade or donate to us, I am scott at kalani.com. You can email me, contact me, or talk to me um, after this event during the potluck portion. Um, and I would love to you know, create a barter economy with these things. Yes? Scott, one, two, two. It's two T's, thank you. Um, Yes, so I'm looking to get as many different plant varieties here because one of the things that I see that we can do at Kalani is actually create a seed bank for the community. The more stuff we can grow here, um, the more seeds we can collect, the more cuttings we have, the more varieties of things, the more we can make that available to the community. And at some point, um, I hope to have um, a canoe plants seed bank here, and that might be five to ten years. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the canoe plants, they are the plants that the Polynesians brought over, um, and that. They have thousands of years of agriculture using and are adapted for these environments right here. So that's the place to start. And I hope within the next five years that we actually have a seed bank that we can have available varieties for the community to, to get things from. And th the way I envision that is through the barter economy or the gift economy and an actual bank economy, which is if you donate, then a couple of years later, you get interest, meaning you get your varieties back or other varieties and then some. And so anything you guys can do to help me, any ideas you have as to how that might work, 
um, I'd love to hear from you. So now, um, without further ado, we're going to move on to our presenter. She is the program coordinator for the Hawaii Public Seed Initiative, formed in 2011 to educate and promote seed research on all five islands of Hawaii, the major islands. She lives and works with her partner, Jeff Rausch, on Beach Road Farm in Lower Puna. Um, she has been a seed grower and a seed saver since childhood, and she shares her seed at seed exchanges with neighbors and at seed share stations around the island. And that's an amazing thing that she's done, maybe then we'll talk more about that. But um, I'd like to also say a fantastic mentor for so many of us here, um, my friend Lynn Howe. Thank you, Kalani. What a great vision coming up. And, and with that, you know what I see? I see uh, Puna Seed Ambassador Seed Rack with all of the seeds that we grow that are locally adapted to our different microclimates and um, available to the So, no, I don't want to use them. Can you hear me? No. Can, you, can you come in and away from Okay, so I'd like to introduce um, Alana Stout, who works with me on the Hawaii Public Seed Initiative. She's also doing her graduate work at UH um, in looking at seed stories from around the island and then hoping uh, to find some of the old seeds that came with the different waves of immigration. And because these are the seeds, the treasures people put in their pockets, and when they traveled across the ocean, they wanted to make sure that they had these varieties that they depended on and they were they could grow. So Alana's going to try to uncover that treasure hunt, treasure trust of seeds, but she's going to begin um, with kids and the seed stories and them asking their parents. So it's going to start at the school level. And so I'm really happy to have her working with us on, on our seed project. And then um, Hillary Plaining is, uh, works and lives on our farm, and she's been very, very key in helping me with all of this seed work, too. So um, what I want to do in this is I really want it to be interactive. <coughs> I mean, I've been saving seed a long time, but I don't know everything. And each one of you probably has a little bit of knowledge to share that that's what I want to do today. So, and Hillary and Alana, they're going to jump in. I'll probably forget to mention something that might be important or say something wrong. And so I, I'm just asking them to jump right in. So um, uh, with that, what I'd like to do is get a show of hands. How many people here consider themselves a gardener or a small farmer or a large farmer? Wow, great. Yahoo! Um, and how many people here have intentionally grown a plant? And that is like I said, like saying, okay, I have this pepper, I got it a seed exchange or whatever. I'm going to grow it to seed in my place. How many people here have done that? Wow. Ooh, ooh, that's great. And how many people have done that for more than one generation? In other words, taken that seed they saved and grown it again. That's great. This is great. So we already have the beginning of a seed ambassador group. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that idea later on, and hopefully we can all create that together. Um, so I just want to go through a little bit the flow. Of, it's three hours. is not very long, and we have some hands-on work, and um, I also want to demonstrate some different um, techniques. So it's going to be brief, but there is a worksheet, so you're all going to be working through these concepts and fundamentals um, together in determining what's needed to grow certain plants to seed. So um, to begin with, I really want to ask people in the audience, why, why would you want to save seed? When you can go to a seed company and for, you know, not that much money, buy seed that is, you know, a quality that you think is good quality. But so what's, what's your reason for wanting to go to the effort to save seed? Less, less pests and diseases. Great. So locally adapting the seed to, to resist. I had purchased some fantastic papayas, and I wanted to make sure that I could continue to grow. Great. And it is hard to get all the different papaya seeds. See, we have our poor little decapitated papaya plant over here. And I'm going to show you how to do that. 
Uh, I'm going to show you how to maintain seed purity in papaya and go through the different flower uh, morphology so you know what you have. And then also how to get the plant material to send in for testing to make sure you're starting with what you want to start with. That if you don't want to start with a genetic um, papaya, then it needs to be tested uh, to make sure that you have that seed purity. Anybody else? What about climate change? You know, with the climate changing and um, seeds are intelligent and so they will adapt, but they need to be stewarded into that adaptation. Um, seed consolidation. Seed consolidation, I really want to take some time to talk about that because what is the state of seed in the world and in Hawaii? What's going on? Um, there's some pretty draconian laws being attempted, uh, attempting to be passed in different countries to disallow indigenous peoples to save and share their traditional seeds. Um, interestingly enough, in the European Union, the European Commission in 2000, in, um, I believe it was 12, wrote a uh, legislation to define what seeds could be saved and what could. And they had to be registered, and it cost a lot of money to register it. So for a backyard gardener to say, I've been growing this heirloom seed, uh, and I want to register, it was impossible. I forget how much. It was thousands and thousands of dollars. So, so they, they wanted to create this list and make it illegal to save any other seeds than those unless they were registered. And um, as you can imagine, in Europe, where they have millions of little gardens all over, especially in England, and people say seed like crazy, there was a huge outcry. So they've been working on rewording that legislation. Um, it actually got rejected by um, the Agricultural Commission and the Environmental Commission, saying it was too, too stringent. But they still want to make seed laws. Uh, so it's coming down the pike, and they're making it harder and harder for us to keep seed in the public commons. Other than Monsanto, what's the point of the laws against seed? Just it's large companies, seed grow, you know, seed growing companies. There's quite a few <coughs> big seed growing companies, and then that brings up a good point. Monsanto, um, they now control. Hmm, 55% of the lettuce seed that's grown for grocery stores, 85% of peppers, 75% of tomatoes, and a good share of the other crops. And how that happened was in 2005, they bought a seed company called Seminus. And Seminus uh, sold seed to 40% of the vegetable producers in the United States and 20% in Europe. So they were a huge seed company. They carried heirloom seed, they carried open pollinated, and of course, um, a lot of the hybrids. So when Monsanto bought that, they bought just a giant chunk of genetics. Then in 2008, they bought DeRuiter, and DeRuiter grew seed for greenhouse applications, so a lot of your tomatoes, your greenhouse plants. So between those two companies, they amassed a lot of genetics, and they now basically say, they own the color red in lettuce. So they own all these genes. Um, and these are plants that our ancestors grew and brought, you know, and, and bred in their gardens and passed on for years. A lot of governments, they are saying that they're interested in seed laws or that they, they want to do these seed laws because of concern about um, Invasives or disease being spread through seed savers. So that's really like what's happening in Pennsylvania and the seed libraries here. It's being under I, it, the reason for that for the government's laws is because they're concerned about um, low quality seed being shared in the food system and it being a problem. Which is why we need to be like sure that we're saving seed very well. And the seed lending libraries, right, it's a great idea. A lot of them are right in libraries. They, you check the seeds out. They send you a little reminder. Oh, by the way, you haven't returned some seeds back. Um, and some of them are a little more open. But about a year ago, uh, the state of Pennsylvania 
uh, went to one of the seed lending libraries and told them that, that if they didn't follow the state seed laws, which were which are set up for seed companies, so which means they need to germination test every 400 seeds of every variety that comes in. So you can imagine a seed lending library is not going to do that. Since then, the same thing has happened in Minnesota, Nebraska, and Maryland. And so it's kind of on a roll now. These, these last three states, it's just been within the last couple months. Um, we met with some of our um, attorneys that do pro bono work, and also on the mainland, they're meeting with the uh, same type of uh, attorneys to look at seed laws for sharing, seed sharing, and, um, and to re really rewrite the state laws. So I would recommend uh, that you go to our Facebook page, Hawaii Public Seed Initiative Facebook page. There's a petition on there that they need 10,000 signatures in order for the lawyers to take this work up and hopefully use it for all states, new, a new, new laws in the state constitution that do allow seed sharing without all this crazy following the seed company laws. Um, the other thing is looking at what's happened in Hawaii um, with the seed. Recently, we took a trip to just kind of go talk to UH Seed Lab and find out what's the state of seed in Hawaii. And it's pretty dismal. Um, basically, uh, Hawaii used to be known across the world as one of the great uh, breeders, having some of the greatest breeders of plants for tropical disease resistance and varieties that did well in the tropics. So that started in 1918 and went right up through the 70s. And now that is not being supported at all. No new plant breeders are being hired. They're all working in uh, the technology aspect of things. Um, there used to be over a hundred seed companies across the Hawaiian Islands. Now we have the big five growing corn, um, genetic corn and using experimental uh, pesticides, herbicides. If you've all been following what's going on in Kwanu, then you know about that. So, um, this, so we went to the seed lab and we thought, okay, cool, we're going to have all this great equipment, we can get some ideas, and it's this little tiny classroom very small, and, it, and they had some, like, three or four different little, very um, low-tech seed cleaning things, which is fun, but they they have no funding. So they had to uh, start a revolving fund by selling their seeds, uh, and it's UH Hawaii, and they do have some good seeds. They have some of the old varieties, but not many, because they've been lost. They got lost in the flood a couple years ago. Um, the old plant breeders, either moved on or died and passed their seed on to graduate students that didn't get grown out. So all these amazing varieties uh, that were bred for tropical growing are, are gone, basically. So there's very few left, but there are a few. And I did put a, um, the seed lab information over on the table. And um, they do, they have a good pepper variety I've been growing for years and saving the seed from. Um, they have both the GE papaya and the regular, and now they say that they have tested it. It's not contaminated, the one that's um, <coughs> not the uh, GMO papaya, and because they had some trouble with contamination in the past. So um, that is what's going on with seed in Hawaii. So because of that, the Hawaii Public Seed Initiative has created a network of uh, growers and seed savers, and along with... Um, three UH CTAR representatives who travel with us and help do education and really support the seed growing. Um, we, we work to try to find people like all of you to educate and then work with in the future to create a healthy seed thriving growing and an adaptation in Hawaii. So what we really need to do is we all live in different microclimates. So what I grow at 50 foot elevation may or may not do well if you're up the mountain. And we're working on identifying those varieties that do well. And I'll let Alana talk a little bit about projects she just uh, finished working on. 
I did this project. It started out as a little project for a GIS class. If you look at the um, USDA climate zones for Hawaii, they don't really make sense. They're only determined by minimum annual temperature, which puts everywhere on the coast in basically the same zone. Um, we all know that all the zones, you know, that's not a whole the same zone. Um, there's also a sunset, doesn't have very, sunset, Western Garden Book. They make climate zones, but they are, that include rainfall factors, but that only defines two zones for the entire state. So we made this um, map, which looks at moisture zones based on rainfall, and then looks at elevation. It combines those two, and it makes 18 different zones for the entire state. And it's going to be available online, and what we've done is put out surveys to different farmers and gardeners who live in those zones so that you can go to, I live in zone 4A, and I can go, okay, well, I want to see what other gardeners who live in zone 4A have, what kind of tomatoes have been successful for them. So that's going to be available on, on the Hawaii Public Seed Initiative website soon. We're just finishing up some of the bugs. And then hopefully, as, as we all start growing things together, each of you can input into that. We yeah. initially asked people who have been growing the same variety successfully for two or more years to input those varieties so we know um, that they actually do do well. We don't recommend, make recommendations about seed companies. The descriptions might um, say where, where the, the description came from in the seed companies, but really we can't. Um, make recommendations, but I, I think if we all talk to each other as growers and farmers, I, I source seed from lots of different places for different reasons. And, um, and these are important questions to ask yourself. So when you're growing to seed, it's a little different than growing just for food. So there's some things that you really want to think about, there's some things you want to ask yourself. Um, you, uh, one thing is, can you keep records? Because you're really going to need to keep records, even at a minimal level. Just um, you know, what what plant you grew, what variety, and what date you picked the seed, and then that way, when you pull it out five years later and it doesn't germinate, you know why. Maybe, uh, maybe it will. But so you you want to know what your goals are. You want to know why am I why am I growing this to seed? Is it because I do want to adapt it for for instance, I have a lot of trouble with tomatoes. Um, I live at a 50-foot elevation. It's kind of hot and humid. They get they either get stung or they get um, gray leaf, gray, gray leaf mold, a fungus. Um, and so I have one variety, and now two. I just discovered another one um, that does well for me. And so I I have to look, like then go through a whole selection process, which we'll talk about in order to save the best seeds. So you want to know, what are your goals? How long is that plant going to be in the ground? If I'm going to grow squash or tomatoes, you know, I can, I can pick it when it's ready to eat, save seed, and so it's perfect. If I want to grow lettuce to seed, it's a two to four month deal. And you're not going to be picking many leaves because you're going to be robbing the plant for um, its nutrients. So you have to be aware that, okay, do I have the space to put that space aside for that length of time? Do I have the energy to um, look at disease resistance, to see what pests are attacking it, to keep it safe? Um, do I have the time to do that? And also, is it going to need staking? Like lettuce gets, when it goes to seed, it's like this. And then you get a wind and it's like that. So you want to be able to stake it. And then it's a dry seed, in other words, and we'll, we'll go into this more uh, as we go along. But you're going to need to protect it once it goes to seed from, from rain and moisture. So there's things you need to know, and we'll, we'll talk about those more later. Um, the other question is, um, what kind of method are you farming? Are you conventional? Do you do natural farming? Are you organic? That's going to really determine where you get your seed. Organic seed that you get in seed catalogs are grown with low inputs. They're grown in organic systems. They're not baby with every convent, um, every type of fertilizer and make them grow really good and juicy. And the seed really is learning as it's growing. So it, it has memory of that and it's adapted to that. Genetically, it's, it's, it's adapted to those conditions. 
So if you're growing in low input conditions, you will do better if you source organic seed or seed from people who don't use um, the conventional fertilizers. So that's another thing to look at. The other thing is, well, you know, I live in a tiny house with a tiny yard and I really want to grow the seed, but I don't have much space. Can I do it in pots? And some of the crops you can. You can grow the seed in pots. Um, we work with Russell Nevada, who's the head of CTAR um, for all the islands, actually. And he, <laughs> he lives where it's rainy. And he likes to, he, he's a, he was an old time lettuce breeder, and he likes to grow lettuce uh, seed and do breeding, but he's wet. And so he just digs the plant up when it's starting to go to seed, and he puts it in a pot and puts it under his eave, and he lets it go to seed. So it's not like, you know, there's, there's some things you can do if you're in situations that are a little trickier. Um, yeah, um, one of the things, I just brought these to show you. We have a lot of trouble with uh, snails, slugs, and even birds eating our seedlings when we put them on the ground. So we tend not to start seed in the ground. We tend to start seed and get it up about, you know, where it's healthy and growing and the roots aren't coming out of the bottom of the pot, but it's filled out nicely. And you can just dump the pot upside down and check. And then we'll transplant it because we don't have so much um, attrition to the insects. And then what we do now is we, if it's a big plant, like a bean, we just cut the bottom out of a one gallon pot and we put that over the bean and the bean, you know, it grows up through that. And they don't seem to climb up these things. We also, if it's a smaller plant, I, I just cut the bottom out of a little four or three inch pot or, you know, just a cup. Starbucks cups, rummage through their trash can, they're great, they last pretty long in um, sunlight. So, you know, protecting from insects, I mean, that's just a no-brainer even if you're just going to grow vegetables. But with seed, you're going to be having to pay attention to that for a lot longer. So then, next, you know, you, you really need to think about where are you going to buy this seed or get this seed or, and what are the advantages. There are a number of seed companies that only sell organic seed. Um, their family farmers co-op works with, I believe, seven growers across a couple of states, and they only sell high quality organic seed online. So they're a co-op. Um, you might want to get unusual seed, and Baker's Creek is great for that. You, um, you're going to want to look for seed that's open pollinated. So when you look in a seed catalog, like let's say you go to Johnny's, uh, and Johnny sells open pollinated and heirlooms and hybrids. So we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between all those, but open pollinated will sometimes have an OP in parentheses. Heirloom, they'll just, you know, they'll tell you it's an heirloom. They, they want to sell those heirlooms. Uh, and if it's a hybrid, it's going to have an F1. And we'll talk more about why you do not want to buy any hybrids uh, if you're going to grow the seed. Let's see. So that's anything I missed there? Okay, so what we're eventually going to get to is you have some worksheets, and we're going to work through different crops. Um, easier to say, harder to say, and fill in all those little blanks. So through that, you're going to get a better understanding of what those crops mean. So a few fundamental concepts. Let's just go right now to um, open pollinated. It openly pollinates, and if it doesn't cross with another plant of the same variety, you will get an offspring exactly like the parent. So that's the type of seed you want to work for, or excuse me, source. Um, heirloom, same thing. All heirlooms are open pollinated. Not all open pollinated are heirlooms. And what's the difference? Um, it's the semantics, actually. Yeah, and they're older. They've been saved for three or more generations. Some people say they're seed that was saved uh, before the war, before all the um, commercial chemical, uh, uh, chemical fertilizers came in. So they're an older variety. Now, whether they're any better than just an open pollinated, that's really a question because how have they been saved? 
how have they been selected for after over three generations? So they may or not may or may not be, you know, any better than just a straight open pollinated. The better thing is subjective too, because you might be growing, some, you might really want to baby something for flavor that's, you know, got wonderful flavor but takes a lot of attention, or you might want something that's really disease and insect resistant that you don't have to, you know, necessarily pay as much attention to. So that <coughs> some of the heirlooms, that's something to think about. They, they, you want to look at the different factors or the different qualities. That but the, uh, if, if you look at heirloom tomatoes, they are really difficult to grow in Hawaii. And um, usually because a lot of them are pretty soft skinned, and we have the fruit fly problem. Um, so I haven't had any success. I haven't talked to a lot of people that have had success with the heirlooms. So, you know, it's one thing to think about. Um, the reason you don't want to buy hybrid seed is because the hybrid comes from two parent lines and they're very different and they breed a hybrid, you know, like let's say they want a disease resistant tomato um, that's purple. So they'll take a parent line that tends to go towards purple and a parent line that is completely disease resistant but almost inedible. Um, and, and, and a lot of, you know, it comes from wild stock and, or it's so tiny it's not worth picking. Um, so they'll breed those two, and the seeds from those are what you get when you buy a hybrid. Now, if you want to grow those seeds again, you really have to go back to the seed company and get the seeds again, because if you plant them out, either they may or may not germinate, but if they do germinate, you're going to get everything under the sun of both parent lines, which if you're a more advanced seed saver and you're trying to break a hybrid, that could be great. But if you're just growing as a vegetable grower and wanting to save seed, it's a nightmare because you're not getting what you think you were going to get.